sometimes you, in different markets require some deviation from right. the center line. Right. The further you stray from the center line, though, the more likely you are to cross into someone else's lane or, or be hit by oncoming traffic, go off the road, etc. Welcome to the Disruptance Podcast. Here are your hosts, Eric Forney and Michael Bounds. Mike, every week on the show, we aim to disrupt the way real estate agents and entrepreneurs think about their business and life. And this week, we want to continue the conversation we've been having around um, the commandments of business, right? The difference between being in an entrepreneurial company versus being in a corporate company. And so um, let's get into the second half of what those conversations and what those commandments of an entrepreneur business are. Kate, what's um, uh, start us off. What's the what's number seven, I believe, yep. on the list? So success strategy number seven is take action. Whenever possible, make things happen. Don't wait for others to make the first move. This is so important. Like, if you don't, to be honest with you, this should be number one. Like, to me, I, to be honest with you, this should be number one. And this is what stops most people is they they don't take action. Um, why, why do you suppose, I have a theory on why that is. Why do you suppose that is, Eric? I mean, you know, there's a couple different things. Um, one, leadership. Um, it, we could argue um, probably childhood uh, <laughs> is probably another one. And then um, I, I would say a lot of it is, could be education related. Okay. Um, so uh, let me unpack a little bit of that. And when I say leadership, um, when I think about uh, the idea of multiplying leadership or diminishing leadership. Um, the diminishing leader confuses the action taker okay. by having inconsistent responses or inconsistent directive. And so um, if you think about if, if, um, if a leader gives you the direction to run, to go out and, and uh, take off for a run and you go um, headed west um, chasing sunrise, and and the the you come back to the leader and the leader gets pissed mm -hmm. because um, they told you to go take a run to find sunrise and you've headed west. Well, for the person who may have experienced that that type of childhood or or the education system with the diminishing leader where um, where where no one accepted responsibility for not giving clear and consistent directive then that employee or that person in that organization can begin to um, take less and less action because they're not given clear directive. And then there's no responsibility or acceptance from the leader to realize, okay, I probably gave marginal directive. Um, and so a diminishing leader can be a, can be a really common and obvious reason why people don't take action. So, so let's say that we've got a leader who's giving clear directive and that they're um, consistent. Um, I guess I say childhood okay. because um, I, I would imagine that someone listening to shows had some childhood trauma um, where you get told by a parent that, um, you, you know, that, that uh, don't ask questions, um, just do it because I said mm -hmm. um, where, where there's no or, or you're in trouble for taking the wrong action all the time. Right. That can carry over into um, into adulthood and into business, where unfortunately you freeze. Mm. That's your default programming because making a mistake is punished more than taking action. Um, so leadership is the one of the biggest determiners of whether or not I think people take action. You can coach people into taking action with the right leadership. Yeah. I've even found myself in poor leadership with poor leaders um, not taking action. Yeah, I, uh, for me, I think I talk about this quite a bit is it was organization. So you find people uh, that don't take action because you say you have a leader that doesn't give good instructions and they give you a really vague do this. You still are. You still have to do it. Yeah. So how do you break that down into bite size and then take actions on that next step? So getting clarity around, like looking at it as project management has allowed me to take action. Um, I just, I'm really organized and I'm very clear. 
And then I just write things down. I I do notes and then I find that a big project will end up being done. So um, I guess the biggest change for me is to take big projects and chunk them down into smaller bite sized pieces. And then that cumulative of them steps will end up being something really, really great. You know, we had Adam on the show last week and um, and recently, you know, the two of us have, have begun working together as a, as a partnership as part of uh, the her group and, and you know, the, the massive vision and company. And, you know, I'll, I'll tell you one of the one of the things that I enjoy um, about Adam is that I have zero doubt that when he um, throws a Frisbee with minimal directive and minimal clarity that he wants me to go chase it and if i run it down <laughs> with the wrong um right result or the or there are some um flaws or imperfections to it i'm not worried about the repercussions of a diminishing leader like i'm not going to get my ass chewed because right. i brought a project back that i gave 110 percent to that was maybe not perfectly in alignment with the vision um but i've been i've, I've worked with leaders who are are that yeah, way yeah yeah and right. so knowing that you have the right leadership helps you to take action Absolutely. that much faster and and so i think about the fact that like you have to show up um as as a employee and take action and then if the leader is diminishing you're, they're quickly eroding that trust um, time after time after time, and they've got to get out of the way. Otherwise, if you can't take action and without repercussions, then it might be the wrong organization. Yeah. That kind of leads into um, the success strategy number eight, which is be open, be receptive to new ideas and initiative initiatives, prepare and plan for change. And I, I do kind of feel like I agree I've watched Eric kind of have chase a, a frisbee, and how Adam does just enable Eric to go after it and then come back with something. And then, but Eric's also kind of like, at least from what I've seen the last couple of years, is his approach to business is uh, at least just move forward, break shit, then fix it. Break shit. And so, but not being afraid to, and that's something that he's always at least empowered Kate and I with, with uh, even with the podcast or with content is like, let's just try it and see what happens and then reevaluate. And so I think from that leadership perspective, if you are open-minded and you are just, you're not trying to micromanage a result, you just trust that somebody, you have the right people to get you the result, then you've kind of got yourself a dream team set up. Thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Because otherwise you have to, you end up being the lid of, of the organization on everything you know we um uh we have a we have a guy that works with us um who we've recently partnered with as well austin and um you know i've really tried to um, empower him with um taking action on some like sales objectives and on some growth objectives and um and he's a he's a quick starter he's probably a much um quicker action taker even than i am um he's similar to mike in that regard mike takes action faster than i do as well and um and and so um there are a couple of things that he sent to me to, to review the last couple of days and i or in the last couple of weeks and i looked at him and i'm like gosh i wouldn't do them this way and, you know my first instinct is like to to like try to respond to mm -hmm. respond and tell someone how to do them and why why i think my approach is the best approach to doing it but then what i realized is if i do that then i'm actually just taking away the growth opportunity for someone to learn leadership by having to beat their head against the wall the same way that i did and so getting in the way um can be one one of the ways to diminish leadership and also to not be open-minded to new ideas and new ways of doing things you can't have innovation without having mistakes and without a willingness to try something new and so the hardest part can be um being a leader and letting go of things to say okay well yeah do i know for sure it won't work yeah, that's the hardest part about being an entrepreneur because I'm gonna tell you guys high stakes poker. It's just yeah, and I, I'm gonna. There's a secret. The secret is how an entrepreneur is able to have consistent success is because they're following a model, and they're doing the same thing over and over again. 
So when you say, Mr. Entrepreneur, we're not doing that this way anymore. And you have had all your success and everything you've built, your baby has been built on this model. And now you're telling me that model doesn't work. You take it personally. So that's the reason why you see a lot of these businesses die after they 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 and you have somebody come in and disrupt their business. Blockbuster could have been Netflix. Yeah. So that's that's the challenge as an entrepreneur. Not only are you refining your models and what got you there, you have to look for threats and what's going to disrupt your am I am I am I currently doing, you know, what needs to be done to serve this market? Has the market left me by? Mike, it's so it's so crazy, though, because what's what we know is that the best way to learn how to be open to other ideas is to reflect on history and other businesses. Yeah. And the beauty here in, in business disruption is that there are those who have lived before us who've dis had industry wide disruption. And for whatever reason, this like innate human fear is to like cling to everything and control what we believe to be controllable. And yet the reality is, is that someone will come along and disrupt the industry, your business, the way that business is conducted um, if we're always clinging for control. And so we have a choice to make around new ideas. And that is, am I going to let my competitors implement new ideas and new initiatives and, and new models? Or am I going to do that? Mm -hmm. And in order to implement oftentimes new ideas, new models and, and new disruptive innovation, you have to be willing to commit the harm against yourself. Yeah. You have to be willing to inflict damage internally and rather than suffer external um, infliction of damage. And that's because, you know, when you look at the automotive industry, this is the playbook that um, that Honda ran and Toyota ran and Kia ran. And um, it, what it looked like was originally, you know, it was Detroit. Right. You had, you had all your major auto manufacturers in Detroit that were um, producing and, and really dominating the American car market. And then along comes Honda and they come in at the low entry level um, price market. I think they're originally the Civic was something like in that ten thousand dollar range. And the the the, the cost overrun of GM and Chrysler and Ford was so big at scale and with unionization and retirement. factory. Yeah. Retirement <laughs> benefits, all these, all yeah. these complexities that were causing the manufacturing costs to go up, um, made it to where they couldn't or were unwilling to compete against Honda. And so they said, all right, you know what? Swim down in the shallow end, Honda, no big deal. You're not a threat to us. Well, enough people bought Civics eventually to where it went, okay, now we, we've seen the Honda brand enough. We've got some mind share and some market share. Now let's introduce the um, Accord. And then it went, okay, now that competes, you know, with the, with the entry level Chevy and the entry level Ford. And then, and then Honda, you know, builds another up level from there. And, and now you can buy $90,000 Hondas or you can buy mm -hmm. um, Toyotas and Acuras into the 150s yeah. and up. Yeah. And so it starts the with NSX, the disruptive man. innovation at the bottom. And Ford had the option, GM had the option, Chrysler had the option to stop it before it ever started. All they had to do was go down and smack Honda out of the market in the shallow end yeah. Lose a little bit to save a lot later. Yeah. But instead, they needed bailed out because of all of that uh, overgrowth and complexity that didn't allow them to innovate. Yeah, I was actually thinking about like the oil industry. Like they really have some thinking to do. Yeah. Like they can either be the leaders in what what's next or they can cling to what got them here. And so we all in our business, we all have moments like that. And so um, it, it's happened to a lot of businesses. So it's having the awareness of, OK, how do I pivot? I, this is what got me here. This is the systems and the models that got me here. OK, if you start having diminishing returns or you start seeing like, how can you be on the forefront? I'm always looking and saying, OK, what is somebody else doing and how can I implement that in my business? I feel like there's like a really good sentence in this chapter where it says, if you look at changes as interruptions 
and the wrong way of doing things, then life in an entrepreneurial company will be a difficult one. And I do <laughs> feel like that is a, that's huge, yeah. a big way just to like you either lean into the change that's happening or the disruptions or you just dig your heels in and just like hope that an existing way of doing things is going to hold out. I'm oh. sure the or the horse and buggy people took that. They took that approach. Like, yeah, what? I'm gonna dig not? in. Yeah. This horse and buggy thing ain't gonna stop. My <laughs> <little> horse is <laughs> just fine. fine. In fact, isn't that what Henry Ford said? Right? If I'd asked the people what they wanted, they would have told me they wanted a better tractor. Yeah. And instead, it was the, knowing that the direction of the industry was automobiles, not better tractors, and not better horse and buggies. I mean, I remember Elon Musk sitting with um, Air Force General recently, and um, the the Air Force was just like totally glossing and and subtle flexing about their their new fighter jet, mm-hmm. and um, they they're hoping to get this like all inspiring look at us response from elon musk about the the prowess of this new fighter jet and elon's like yeah it's okay it won't be relevant in 15 years humans won't even bother flying these things to fight in uh in wars anymore anyway it'll all be um unmanned drone uh airfare and so not that impressive yeah and so here, here's this Air Force general subtle flexing about this amazing new innovative technology uh, and not getting a single pat on the back. In fact, someone's thinking um, next generation yeah. and wondering why you're still hunting with a bow and arrow when there's the ability to have, uh, you know, high powered weaponry. Why are you so antiquated? Yeah. Yeah. And how do we do that in our business? Yeah. Like we literally have to think like that in our business every day. Yeah. So, and if you're not thinking that way, that's the, the, if you're not, you're getting left. You know, I heard Gary Keller this morning. I was listening to the most recent um, life episode that he does uh, monthly. And, you know, uh, he was talking with Jason Abrams about it. And Jason said, I remember, um, Gary, I brought back um, my perfect uh, P&L where we finally hit the, the MREA model with a P and L and everything um, came in and was, and was like right dialed in. And you go, why did you do that? And he goes, well, what do you mean? You, you put in the book that this is how I do, this is how I do this. And he goes, yeah, the beginning of the book says this is a model, but it might, it may not work for all people and all personalities and all business environments. And so trying to just cling to the, the yeah. perfect center line of the model might not have actually been beneficial for you. You have to understand there sometimes, you, in different markets require some deviation from right. the center line. Right. The further you stray from the center line, though, the more likely you are to cross into someone else's lane or or be hit by oncoming traffic, go off the road, et cetera. But there there are times you need to innovate and, and disrupt the, the model. model. That's right. Because this is the thing. That book is how old? 2000, basically. 2000, yeah. so 21 so 20, years old. Yeah. In tw- 2000, the Facebook. Yeah, the Google yeah. ads. So yeah. they were talking about sending postcards and sending mailers. Yeah, and I read right. talking about they were talking about classified ads. So like if you're going by the economic model and how much money you're spending on marketing, well, print can cost more than digital. So then you can enhance, you can build on that model. I'm sorry, I'm just I'm on a rant here, but no, it's good. That, I mean that's anyway. So what's the next question? <laughs> <laughs> it's what we're here for. That was a smooth transition. Yeah. Sorry. Well, the <laughs> next uh, success strategy is communicate. Learn how others like to communicate. Close open files. Let people know when tasks are done and what happened. What I want to get to, though, is this Yeah, can we part. skip that? Because we neither one say, of us should talk about communication. <laughs> like, neither. <laughs> there, there is not two men in this room that should talk about communication, especially the two of us. There's a couple of like <laughs> bullet points that we can outline, but <laughs> as far as execution man. goes. I'm glad that Eric recognizes that I'm doing <laughs> this is not my strength. Uh, I like the definition that they have here. Communication <laughs> is the response you get, not necessarily what you intended. Um, because that, that's dope. Um, uh, that definition of communication is nice because it places the responsibility on you, the communicator and not the receiver to hear it. Yep. 
And so I do think there's a couple of like bullet points I'm just going to outline and then you guys can kind of fill in the blanks here, but they've kind of got the, uh, essential tools of community of communicating. And one is how we like to give information. Um, two is how we like to receive information and it may not be the same way as how we like to give it. Um, three, the best time and worst time to communicate with us. And four, what we need when we're stressed to effectively communicate. Um, To back it up just a little bit, how we like to give information. Um, A lot of people, um, they talk about this Colby profile. Have you guys done the Colby yet? No, I've done a lot of them. I need to, there's always, there's always a test to tell you who you are out there. (laughs) Yeah. There's always somebody labeling you. (laughs) I know. (laughs) Um, but like how we like to give and how much mental energy we have for different types of activities. Um, what I liked was this, how we like to receive information. This person talks about how they strongly dislike receiving voicemails and especially detailed ones. And, uh, but in how they would rather just get an email but she also loves leaving voicemails because it's the closest way that she can get to being face to face on the phone to capture her energy tone and versus just sending an email or a text. So yeah. what do you guys run into kind of with your agents, with other people you're talking to with community? I mean, with millennials, it's like, Hey, I'm going to send you a text telling you that I'm going to call you to give you a proper heads up or, um, some people just don't ever call you back. Like, yeah. what's what's your communication style? I guess let's for one, kick it off. My there. voicemail is currently full, and it yeah, has I been think full mine is for too. like <laughs> I think mine is too. Yeah, yeah. Like I can't even keep up with my voicemail. Voice says text me. That's it. Okay, <laughs> that's what I should. I think mine up. actually says fax on it. I think you can actually <laughs> press a number for a fax. So that's how antiquated mine is. Do you know? Um, the only way, and so what happens is the more you lead people, the more people communicate. Um, I'm trying to get better at this. Um, I, this is this is like, this, this, you guys, this podcast is just as much coaching for me as maybe perhaps if you guys are watching it, you're trying to learn something as well. Uh, I, I, this is something I'm struggling with and I try to get better at it. The one thing that I, I do do a lot better job at is I keep notes and if somebody texts me or email me, I'll put it in my notes. And then when I follow up later on the day, I'll then I, I try to call everybody back. You have to be systematic. So I take an hour to go through and just reply to people that are that make it to my notes. Uh, and then I have an assistant that watches my email. So if I don't if I miss something, um, she's all over it. So she's sending me a text message or she's responding on my behalf. Uh, for me, you know, I, I do not like text message anymore. I think we don't have to go back that many episodes ago yeah. where we talked about it and, and partly why is I actually think text is one of the most antiquated and backwards ways to communicate a lot of times anyway. I mean, it's fun for like quick, um, uh, non-important me- yeah. like info exchange, you know, like we'll text, we have a, we have a group, we have a group text, <laughs> yeah. right. That we text on. So it serves a purpose, but it's very rarely to exchange important information and yet most people are using it that way for whatever reason and um and i say that because what if i'm somewhere that um i need to follow up with something the last thing but i'm not able to do it in the moment let's see i'm i'm walking into dinner or i'm walking into an appointment and and you text me and i open it and i read it and i see it that's great but I don't have a way to market for follow-up. I don't have a way to easily um, give it to, to whomever the proper party is to take action on it. Mm-hmm. And so email allows me to actually do that, right? I can flag it for follow-up. I can forward it. Somebody can be in my inbox and actually read it and take action on it. Or it can be referenced five years later. Text messages, not so much. Mm-hmm. Um, What I found, though, is recently is that um, because I have to like kind of I'm we're we're doing a lot of like reporting and I'm communicating with way more people now than than what I was previously. And what I found was that I'm actually really slow with email for whatever reason, what I want to say and what my fingers type. Yeah, um, there's a major disconnect. And so 
I have to do a f- Friday leadership report and uh, and just kind of an update on like, okay, what are my priorities? What did I accomplish? What are my priorities moving forward? And um, and yesterday I transcribed it because it was so much easier for me to talk to my phone, let my phone type out what I was saying and send the email than it was for me to type it all and go through that slow process. So I think it's figuring out what are your, what are your most efficient ways of communication, but then also recognizing that communication is the relationship. Yeah. And so we talked about just in our call yesterday, Michael, um, that you've had better success with VAs than what I have had and what, um, what we've had at the previously with at the office level as well because of consistent communication. Yeah. So oftentimes the medium of communication isn't nearly as important as the frequency and yeah. clarity of communication. Yeah. So one thing that, and I want to clean up, it depends on who. So if I'm talking to a client, being systematic in my communication is paramount. So use the use of a CRM, to systematically send emails and text messages and also put alerts on my reminder to remind me to follow up with them on a systematic basis. That, that is, you're right. It's just, actually it's the cumulative. It's being repetitive. I meet with my VA every day, so nothing gets dropped. Um, so as long as you are able to have a consistent conversation, it, I meet with my VA for 15 minutes every morning. And I get colossal results because I have that 15 minutes with her every day. And then we're messaging and slacking each other throughout the day. So I think I give I've been harder on myself from a communication perspective than I than I really am. I'm, but it's something that I'm getting better at, if that makes any sense. It, what I heard when you talked about communicate, when you read that communication piece was the idea of tying loose ends on communication. And then also um, that the communicator is the one responsible for love what's that. communicated. I love that, but I challenge the belief of that. And okay. I say that because if you rely on me to communicate with clarity the vision, as a receiver, you failed yourself and me. And I and that's because you're likely going to get an abstract vision of 30 miles in the future of what it looks like. And the receiver oftentimes needs to ask questions. I believe it was um, um, commandment number two, where uh, it was that there needs to be questions about what does that look like when it's completed and done well? But, you know, you said that it was, um, Going, to, you said paint the walls white. Is that like stark white? Is that off white? Is that right out of the paint can white? Is there any color or tint added to it? Right. There needs to be those clarifying questions. And so, communication is a two person or a sender and receiver process. The problem that I have with most people when they're receiving is they don't ask questions, they think they understand. And so the most effective way to have communication, in my opinion, is when there is that feedback process. It is the feedback of the receiver that indicates whether the communicator, the sender, has actually communicated effectively. Most people who receive a message neglect the feedback portion of it, and that's oftentimes where the failure occurs. Can sure. I do one more thing? Yeah. And it's also, as a leader, you have to have the right person. So, okay. Is that train? Is that, I agree with you. Yeah. I got this question last week. Is that a um, learned skill or a inherent skill? I think it's learned. Okay. And um, I just know it because I had an assistant and I would give her something. I give her direction and I would say, okay, this is what I need. And it, it, I, it kept coming back a disaster. Okay. Okay. <laughs> And so then, okay, and then I would give it to someone else and it would come back and it would be great. That's talent, right? Yeah. And so by, it also depends on as a leader, like if you want to be that micromanaging, I need to tell you everything, I need to be clear, or Kate and Tyler, I need a dope podcast. And then guess what? The podcast keeps getting doper, right? So it's part of it as a leader is picking the right people. And then casting. And it's the right people for you, 
right? Is I think that that's the I think that's key too. Is it doesn't necessarily have to mean that like yeah, totally. if we don't work well together, that you're not someone hyper hyper talented. It might just yeah. be that like we don't we don't, we don't dance. Yeah, we don't. Yeah, that's right. We step <laughs> on each other's feet, but you're one hell of a dancer. Yeah, right? you can. Uh, you up there doing the jig? I'm over yeah. here doing the the cha cha or whatever. <laughs> I don't right. know. It's just you're great at that, but we're yeah. just doing two different things. You go do that over there, and I'm gonna go do that over here. Yeah, 